Myself, Dr. Subhapaka Sanyal, I am the hematologist, hematologist and a bone marrow transplant physician. I am attached to Murud Fortis for last 10 years. Hematology means disease of the blood. So basically, hematology is divided into two divisions. One is benign hematology, one is a malignant hematology. So benign hematology is the diseases in the, of the RBC, of the WBC, of the platelet, mostly like thalassemia, anemia, immunotrombocytopenic purpura, these sort of disorders. And malignant hematology mostly comprises of three diseases, acute leukemia, chronic leukemia, multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and few other bone marrow failure syndrome like aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, etc. So, so basically patients of hematology comes to us with some abnormality in their simple report called com complete blood count, which is called CBC. So either hemoglobin is low or high, WBC is low or high, there are some abnormal cells in the, in the, in the CBC picture, blood picture, or low or high platelet count. These are the common abnormality we found in the CBC and these patients are generally referred to us. Patients' symptoms are very non-specific in hematology. They get some weakness, fatigue due to low hemoglobin. They are getting some recurrent infection due to low WBC count. They have some bleeding disorders or bleeding symptoms due to the low platelet count. We generally do a couple of investigations which are very simple investigations like complete blood count, biochemistry, peripheral smear examination to reach to a provisional diagnosis and on the basis of the provisional diagnosis we do some of the specific blood tests and the bone marrow examination to conclude the final diagnosis. And according to the final diagnosis we generally move to further classification and prognostication of the disease doing the cytogenetic and the molecular testing. That we do, that we advance lots in the coming, in the last two years. So, bone, indication of bone marrow transplantation or the idea of the bone marrow transplantation depends what disease the patient has, what is the exact uh, grade of the disease and whether it can be curative or not. That is the most important clinical decision we have to take. So, if we divide again the bone marrow transplantation, it is generally two types of transplantation. One is called autologous bone marrow transplantation and other is the allogenic bone marrow transplantation. So common indication of autologous bone marrow transplantation is multiple myeloma and relapsed lymphoma. And common indication of the allogenic bone marrow transplantation is acute leukemia, AML, ALL, depending on the stage and depending on the grade of the disease. Bone marrow failure syndrome like aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, etc. and benign disorders, thalassemia. These are the most common pool of the diseases where transplant can help. Transplant has a very broader terminology. So we generally used to call bone marrow transplantation once upon a time. But nowadays we take the stem cells from the peripheral blood. Here's the terminology which we switch to from bone marrow transplantation to peripheral blood stem cell transplantation. And again peripheral blood stem cell transplantation, peripheral blood stem cell transplantation is two types. One is the autologous peripheral blood stem cell transplantation and one is the allogenic peripheral blood stem cell transplantation. So autologous peripheral blood stem cell transplantation means where we utilize the stem cell from the patient's own blood and allogenic stem cell transplantation can be taken from the donor. Most commonly we prefer the matched sibling donor that means brother sister donor. If not available then mismatch donor which is available from the different registries of the country and abroad and haploidentical donor where the donor can be available from the family but they are half matched. So now you can ask me the questions what are you are relevant to us. Sir, uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the success rate uh, in transplant related cases? And uh, does it differ depending upon uh, the uh, disease that the patient is suffering from? That's a good question. So there are two issues here. So absolutely, depending on the disease, we differ that what type of transplantation you want. 
uh, I told you the indications of the transplantations like myeloma and the relapsed lymphoma, we more like to go for the autologous transplantation and rest of the marrow failure, blood hematological malignancies like leukemia and the bone marrow failure, we like to have the allogenic bone marrow transplantation. So autologous bone marrow transplantations, the success rate again depends on the what type of side effects you are developing with that and definitely on the disease profile, what type of disease you have. So autologous stem cell transplantation, the main side effects are limited to the first 15-20 days of the transplant time, transplantation time and it is mostly the infection complications like a febrile neutropenia, mucositis, diarrhea and as soon as the counts, patient's counts recovery starts happening, the everything changes and the patient generally getting better. Transplant related mortality in, uh, again in autologous bone marrow transplantation is very less. In multiple myeloma, it is in the range of the 1 to 2 percent, and the lymphoma, it is slightly more, say probably 3 to 5 percent. Uh, generally, post autologous stem cell transplantation complications are almost negligible, but few patients after complete re recovery from their counts sometimes develop engraftment syndrome or engraftment fever, but these are all manageable side effects. Allogenic stem cell transplantation, mostly we see three types of complications again, four types of complications. Obviously, febrile neutropenia during the neutropenic period. Then, when the patient's counts recovery happens, then the graft versus host disease. Sometimes, patient can develop venoocclusive disease of the liver, and very rarely, sometimes depending on the disease, patient can have the graft failure, which is in the category of the one to two percent of the total risk involved. So, what is the difference between allogenic bone marrow transplant and haploidentical bone marrow transplant? So, the question is basically the who will be the Donor, who will be the donor for the patient, right? Whatever I understand no, sir, correctly. What is the difference between allogenic bone marrow transplant and haploidentic okay. bone marrow? So make the question a little broader. Uh, there are two types of transplantation. One is the autologous stem cell transplantation, and one is called the allogenic stem cell transplantation. So autologous means the patient own stem cell has been used as a source, which is called auto. And allo means there is a donor involved. So allogenic are actually three types. One is a sibling donor. So sibling means patient own brother sister who are matched. They are called sibling donor. The other type of donor is called matched unrelated donor. So they are not the family member, but their HNA is fully matched or nine by ten matched, and they are actually we obtain from those these donors from the different registries. In our country, there are Thar three registry, NMDP registry, there are some German registry. So we can apply for those uh, registries with the patient's HLA typing and the donors tell them. And the registries actually inform us that whether they have available donor for that. That is called a matched unrelated. That we call MUD, matched unrelated donor. And the third is a haplo donor. Haplo means that in the same family, whether the full match is not there, their HLA is half match, say 6 by 10 or 5 by 10 match, these are called a haplodonor. So they are available within the family itself. So these are the three types of donor we use. This is called haploidentical. So auto means again the same the donor itself and allo means there always a donor involved and donor can be any of the three. And another type of donor that in our country we are not much familiar, that is called umbilical cord bone marrow transplantation. Yes. So that is not very, uh, not very uh, acceptable at this stage of the science. Sir, are, this, are there any risks for the donor? So this is a very valid question when the donor's life is involved. Uh, see, first of all, it is not a surgery. So in liver transplant, kidney transplant or the if you know there is a live donor transplantation where patient has to undergone some knife. Mm -hmm. But here it is absolutely is a medical management. So donor, what do we do with the donor? We give an injection, what is called growth factor, which is a simple insulin-like injection to be given subcutaneously just below the skin. And this is given for only three days. Three to five, sorry, three days in the outpatient basis. And the day four, we generally admit the patient, and then we put a catheter, uh, which we generally do very commonly the dialysis catheter in the neck, which takes hardly 10 15 minutes time. We give some local anesthesia and we make the catheter ready. And the next day, we do the aphoresis procedure, stem cell procedure. So, very simple the basically, we have a stem cell separation machine, we call aphoresis machine. 
So there are three mouth of the catheter. One mouth is connected to the machine. So machine sucks the blood. Machine knows what the stem cells. Machine collects that. The machine does the job, and remaining blood comes out to the another channel to the patient's body. So here no surgery involved. That is a very important myth in this do on the, in the donor uh, collection of the stem cells. But important point is that uh, what is the question about is any major risk involved? Absolutely no. So whatever patient donates the stem cells, there can be a little bit loss of platelet counts. that generally patient recovers in 2 to 3 days time and sometimes patient get little bit body pain little bit discomfort due to the pain due to the gcsf effect that generally goes away by one or two days time as because there is no surgery involved there is no major risk involved to any of the donor's life so only some blood is taken out of the donor right absolutely sir uh, yeah. in so so in this, yeah so in peripheral blood steps is transplantation this is the thing when we take the marrow from the donor so there we generally patient is under the anesthesia general anesthesia for that point of time and we collect the bone marrow in the ot we all check the volume and everything other parameters very strictly and when the anesthetic effect is gone there can be little pain but that can be easily manageable but diabetes you know that more or less more or more or less the we take the stem cells from the peripheral blood very less indications are remaining for the bone marrow taking stem cells from the marrow what are the indications of transplant so this uh, questions i little bit covered in the my introductory uh, uh, speeches but we remember one thing when we talk about the transplantations and the type of the disease that is very important so main indication of the autologous transplantation is a multiple myeloma and the relapse setting of the lymphoma both you know Hodgkin's lymphoma and the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the main indication of the allogenic stem cell transplantation is again the benign hematology and the malignant hematology. So benign hematology, the thalassemia is one of the very common indications of doing allogenic trans stem cell transplantation, and the other allogenic indications are mostly the leukemias, both AML and ALL. Again, depending on the type of the disease and the response of the disease. both mal of failures like aplastic anemia malnar dysplastic syndrome few of the myelo proliferative problem like a myelofibrosis like that question is why it is so costly many times what happens is patient want to do the treatment but the cost is so prohibitive in some cases that they are bound not to take the treatment so that is our question why is it so costly so transplant process is not actually not costly what happens immediately after the transplant the patient's wbc goes down hemoglobin goes down plaque tech goes down so and they develop the febrile neutropenia so most of the use of the antibiotics antifungal few of the investigation as and when required and the most importantly patient need some of the test very periodically that makes the patient cost bill goes up another thing the patient needs very Uh, what i say that uh, very very dedicated you need to work so you need a very trained nurse you need a very qualified doctors to attend the patient very frequently and at the same time that patient general being to be taken care of there are not only the medical management to be taken care of there are lot of other issues also to be handled at the same time it is very unpredictable procedure because you never know what will develop the complications down the line so you can't predict so as and where as and when the situations goes in different way you have to tackle you may need a cardiology issues you may land up in nephrology issues you may need have a gastroenterology issues so different type of issues can come up post transplant so these are the many issues which actually are very interrelated and that makes the issue more costly Uh, sir, I want to know what are the chances of relapse. <laughs> so, whenever we are doing a procedure like so, where cost is involved, you always like to understand the outcome of the result. So, again, the relapse depend on the what type of disease you have. That is the most important thing. But in general, if you, I am talking very, in general note that uh, it's acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. the relapse disease rate is generally 15 to 20%. So remember one thing it is not 
but there are definitely there are significant number of patients can go undergo relapse also down the line. But it is mostly depend on the what the type of the disease. So if we type the disease properly on the before transplantation, we can give amount of the some of the percentage that which person which patient can go into relapse or which patient can go into the remission. Uh, why post uh, treatment is required and what are the precautions to be taken? So the post transplant is required uh, mostly in the allogenic bone marrow transplantation. So there is always chances of the reactivation of the few of the viral, viral infections, fungal infections because they are on the immunosuppressive therapy for some time. That is number one. Number two, some patients develop the graft versus host disease which is type of the complications and reactions of the allogenic trans central transplantation. So they require very frequent follow-up whether they are developing or if they develop then we have to treat that entity. Sometimes patient can develop the venoocclusive disease of the liver which is generally tends to happen within first 90 days of the transplant not beyond that point. And another thing is most important that patient's general well-being and patient has having any problem in the relapsing the disease or not. That is why patient require a long term follow-up for the post allogenic stem cell transplantation. But most importantly, the intensive follow-up needed from mostly the 3 to 6 months period. If the patients are through 6 months, six months down the line, then obviously the intensity of the follow-up drastically reduced.